Okay, so let's get on the way. And just to give you a little bit of a heads up, it's going to be quite a heavy webinar today. And what I mean by that is very educational and content driven around things. So just make sure you're focused and ready to go. So obviously, as I shared last time, I'm not a registered lawyer anymore. My path and my desire is to educate you and give you the knowledge to stand up for yourself and nothing is you know, legal or any kind of other advice or anything else of that magnitude or nature. So a bit of housekeeping, just get rid of all your distractions, turn the mobiles and social medias onto silence because you will want to be focused today. This is important information. So really it's safe to say, and I'd be a bit underestimating it to say we're at a critical time and that's why I'm doing this. And I don't believe we've seen hardly anything yet because in Australia, I think what we're seeing is just the beginning without something quite extraordinary from the people and from those of us, as you will see today, who have the ability to do something about what's happening. So by all means questions, just understand your rules. The rules are quite simple. Um, if I happen to see a question that's right within the flow of the webinar, I will definitely answer it. Most of the time I won't be seeing the questions because I've got Steve and Grace and others moderating them just to, so I can stay focused. The zero tolerance toxic behavior, for those who were here last week just know, yeah, I really just don't have time for it. it, it just, and the main reason is it disrupts everybody else, like people who are trying to listen, who are respectful, who are really appreciative. So I, I just try to get rid of those people and we can all get on with the job. That's how I see it. So taking notes, I would strongly recommend you take some kind of notes because like I said, it's going to go, it's going to be pretty heavy today because what I'll be teaching you today, you really do have to know. And my partner actually said to me, for example, oh, it sounds heavy. Don't know if I should be there. And I said, you have to be there. I said, really? I said, if you value your rights, value your government, um, you know, governmental freedoms in this country that you've had for so long and you want to have any chance of getting back to a normal, not a COVID normal, you're going to want to learn this kind of stuff and find this out. So we'll be covering today, like I said, it's a four part series. The, this is what we're covering today. So the Commonwealth Constitution is mainly, and this is going to be the heavy part because I really, I'm going to make sure today that you get how this all works. So if you, once you understand what's, how our government works and our system, you'll have a lot better understanding of the, of the situation that we're in right now and how perilous it actually really is. So it's, we'll be covering that. There's quite a number of different myths that go around the internet. So I'll be covering off hopefully quite a few of these today. How it will work, it will go up to two hours. When I say up to two hours, my aim is to finish the main core in about 90 to 100 minutes, then take some questions and then obviously finish straight off. So it'll go up to two hours is my aim. Um, question and answer with strict rules. Um, like I said, understatement to say we're in a reformation by understanding the truth where we are really at right now. So yeah, it's just really, it's a sobering time. And you really do. Um, I really appreciate the fact you come out here to listen to this stuff and learn this. So really, really appreciate that. The fact that people have come along here to actually learn this stuff and things like that. There will be a recording of the session, but, 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 and here's the big but. Um, but not all of it. I, I always turn it off just for some of it. One of the things I'll just be upfront with you as well, like I, I said, I'm here to dispel the myths of the internet and teach the truth because we can only work from a foundation of the truth. And the way I see it, it's a little bit like, let's say you, you got a, I remember years ago, I, I suspected I had a serious illness and I just pretended it wasn't the case and was telling everyone I was fine and telling myself, didn't change the fact I really did. And all that happened was eventually the illness caught up with me and it took me a long time to get better from it because I was in such a bad state. These days, as soon as I get a sense there's something wrong, I move fast. So really living in denial, I appreciate the fact of all of you here, and I know I've said that a few times, because basically by you being here, 
means you're really saying I'm willing to not be in denial and just know the truth because I'm not going to promise anything else. And it's, 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 there'll be a lot of stuff you'll hear that may shock you, may discourage you a lot, but there is a silver lining, rest assured. There is a path forward. And the main thing is to understand the path forward from truthful information. Okay, who's ready? Who's ready to learn, understand? They've got their thinking cap on. They're ready to go back to school and write notes and get on top of all this. Who's ready? Who's ready for the long haul and get get an all power parts in the army of God to get get this mess sorted out in Australia? Good. So let's just kind of do it together and get this mess sorted out and. It's, as you will learn today and over the next four weeks, by the end of four weeks, I'll be very surprised if you're not highly encouraged when you realise there's nothing new under the sun. There really isn't. This is not suddenly like some magical, mystical thing that suddenly happened. So one of the things I'll be starting, although many of you would have been here last week and heard stuff, I really felt today, just to start this four-part series off, I'm going to share a bit more about my credibility and things like that, only for the simple reason that many of you don't know me, um, any, I could easily just jump on the internet and make up any crap about myself. So, like I said, I do have over 30 years experience, um, 10 years with the tax office, 20 years in private practice running various things, involved in all kinds of stuff. So I wrote up a bit of a dossier. So I'm a qualified lawyer, accountant and financial planner. I got first class honours um, writing my thesis on native title rights, would you believe it, Indigenous rights and capital gains tax legislation, and I won the prize, the Mallison Stevens Jacks Prize for that. Um, I've had my own various companies, and I have a few now, Wealth Safe, Global Wealth Club, and I used to have my own law firm for many, many years. And I did have a fairly good success rate. I had a huge background in the church, and the only reason I say that is because I happen to be fortunate enough to be in a church that actually taught um, about the coming microchipping, about the new world order, about the Illuminati, about the, the takeover coming and the reset. I, was, I learned all this in the 80s and I'm very grateful for that now. So that gave me a good foundation to start with. I ran a radically awakened physical church in Rockingham in the early 2000s where we covered this stuff. We even had guys from underground movements coming and teaching about the common law, legal rights, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, everything like that. Um, someone's happy you're a Christian. Thank you. I would regard myself as, I have a strong Christian background. I would regard myself as highly more spiritual, Damien, but with our overall, but definitely with that kind of background behind me. That's how I describe it. Um, and as you will see, the Bible, um, the Holy Bible, for example, is a big part of our legal system in Australia. Whether we like it or not, it is. I was part of an off the grid underground movement and that underground movement was um, not just a really weird group of people. We learned everything about off the grid money. I met a guy who five months before September 11 actually told a group of people that something bad would be happening in September that year. And he said what was going to happen or the, uh, the kind of idea. And it happened as he pretty much said. And he talked about the whole takeover of the world by various things. and just all kinds of other stuff. And I also learned about um, economic crashes. I learned about the legal fast stuff, how things really worked. By the time I'd finished in there, I felt both exhilarated and very discouraged and attempting to wake people up back in 2003, 2004, as I'm sure you could appreciate, was a lot more difficult than it is now. But that set the foundation for the day. I, I learned the skills for many, many things around taxes around how to not do voting if I didn't want to and not get fined, how to not do the census if I didn't want to. Um, I, at the time in West Australia, there were, the vaccinations were being pushed even back in the early 2000s and I worked out various ways to deal with it and things like that. Um, chose to not jab our kids at all by and large, apart from our oldest who got a few before we found out the truth. And yeah, basically, so I've been on this path for a very, very long time successfully overcame five regulatory board investigations um you know with various things and using this stuff numerous numerous court case wins and wins against the government and things like that um just for those of you who ever are interested and one of these weird things i still cannot believe to this day i won this but um 
in 2012, I took on a speeding face in, for finding Queensland. And yeah, if you type in those words there, you can read the story yourself about how I went in and won a, a case which I didn't really expect to win, but more did it for kind of just to, you know, see what happened. So been doing this a while and definitely very grateful that I did that. Being candid, a few years ago, I did hit a point in my life when I was pretty down because I thought maybe I've wasted my time. I mean, maybe living my life on the assumption of an apocalypse and governments going crazy, I really am a bit of an extremist and why can't I just be normal and live a normal life? And I'm sure a number of you probably felt that way over the last 10 years. And if you have, just you can happy to you know, just say yes in the chat or raise your hand or whatever. Um, I really did feel that way. And when all this happened now, in a way, it hasn't been easy to see it happen, but I've been relieved to think I'm not completely crazy. And fortunately, the result of it is I had been very ready for what's going on as well. So, so very much as well. Okay, so over the next four weeks too, just to give you the heads up, we're going to be covering this. So next week, I'll be covering about civilization collapses and awakenings in the past and what's happened. I'll be covering about the financial reset in another one. And then we'll be covering about specific topics like jabs, um, everything, centers, a little bit more depth and things like that. Okay. So just a quick reminder of last week, a very quick one about the lowest common denominator principle. Um, really, we are ripe for a takeover. And you will really, really, really see that next week, you know, that we really are as ripe to a takeover as you're ever going to get. And Generally, as you'll learn next week, his societies that actually do the kind of crap that we're doing eventually always collapse, like always. So the, the collapse of our society, the takeover or destruction is as inevitable as the sun going down at night and the moon coming up and the sun coming up the next day. And the only way we can arrest that with a fairly major change of consciousness, action, and in a way we are in society. So we're heading into a social, social and civilization collapse. As I said last week, to say we need a spiritual awakening is an understatement. And just to be very clear, when I say awakening, this has to take action in the political. This has been one of the mistakes, especially in that I see the churches have caused a lot of damage by teaching the, the, what I call the spiritual, but not recognizing that, say, men like this guy in the 1800s who saw a great reformation used to say, you cannot be spiritual unless you're taking action to be a light and making change in your society and in your world. So it, a spiritual awakening is more to, get, is to give you the strength to take action in the political. Attempting to take action in the political by running out there through fear, anger and burning down bridges or whatever may make you feel good for a temporary moment, but not feel so good afterwards and probably not get you anywhere. People forget that the Peasants' Revolt, which I'll be sharing about next week, um, which people hear about ended very badly for the peasants, the people who ran out burning things. The French Revolution, where they were running around doing revolting, they all, most of them end up dying off anyway or in other things. So real awakenings that brought ongoing lasting reform always had a spiritual beginning where society addressed its errors, recorrected its consciousness, had a good look at itself, and then took action in the political from a position of strength. And very quickly, politicians... When you have a changed climate and when you've got individuals refusing to take any kind of lying, tyr tyrannical, dictator, you know, medical mafia type politician, they'll be running for cover and disowning any interest in them very quickly. So this is very, um, it's doable. In other words, it's doable, but it's going to require a lot of work, a lot of education and a lot of willingness to educate yourself, to take the action. And it requires knowledge. My guess is very few of you know much about the law at all. You may think you do, but you probably actually don't. So Sharon says, whinging is wearing thin. Yeah, look, you're better off to just kind of go and live in the bush, Sharon, and live off the, gra off the grass in the middle of nowhere. Or if you're going to stay in the city environment, we may as well actually take some action and all take our place in the army of God. Um, because it's time for all hands on deck for anyone who values your civilization in the same way that our lovely politicians are saying, you know, it's Team Australia, you know, we've all got to do our part for the community. Well, I would say that we've all got to do our part in the spiritual awakening if we value a political awakening and maintaining some semblance of rights and not becoming um, a communist dictatorship. So everyone must play a bit part in the army of God. And that's how I like to see it. 
So, um, however small it may be. And you really don't, it, it can be the tiniest role. Um, in the battles and times past, you may just be the one who brings the provisions to the soldiers. And that's just as important as being a soldier on the front line. I mean, everyone has their part to play in making a change. So you can shift energy and change perception and change things in society. So now comes the heavy part. And this is where it gets a little bit heavy because we're going to start going right back into constitutional law. So can someone please remove this guy, Willie, from the um, Willie Van Alphen, who just keeps pestering when I've said at the start about the questions? That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, so history of our legal system. Um, it comes from England and it comes from the common law. So our legal system, so it's very important to realise that this is where our legal system began and it came from, from the land of England when we were settled as a colony in Australia. So common law was basically, to understand what it is, it means law that is common to the people, like commonwealth, wealth that is common to the people. So the original idea of common law was you've got people living together and you have a common law. My experience, Indigenous tribes particularly get this concept well, like Aboriginals have a wonderful concept of um, common law. They have what's called their dream time law where they see themselves as connected to the land. Aboriginal, um, and I know a lot about the Aboriginal law and the Aboriginal system because I did my whole thesis on that in title as I mentioned. So I studied indigenous um, freedoms and rights and the dream time a lot. And I have to say some of the most fascinating stuff you'll ever see. And very glad that native title was recognized in 1995 to recognize the, gl the glorious heritage that indigenous people bring to the land. And they taught very much about having our connection to the land and making sure that we remain bonded and in union to, our, uh, uh, to the land and things like that. So that was the kind of law that they did. So British Empire, when it was running around taking over different countries, had an international law about the laws of conquest. So basically the way laws of conquest work is let's just say that we went and took over Japan, like we went to war and um, bombed them and took over them. Generally, the law of the conquering um, colony or country then gets imposed upon the law of the country which has taken over. And a classic example we're seeing today is China and Hong Kong. So China has now flexed its muscle over Hong Kong and said, we now own you. And although we're letting Hong Kong by and large still live as a sovereign jurisdiction, they're now saying that, yeah, but that's provided your sovereignty, you do X, Y, and Z. You don't say things on the internet against China. And this is what's been causing all the protests in Hong Kong. So what you're seeing in China and Hong Kong is by and large what happened to Australia 200 odd years ago. That's the simplest way to think of it. There was a country living, there was um, people, indigenous people mainly um, living in the country and England turned up, thought, okay, we like this place. They um, put their flag on, took, took control of the land, um, killed off the indigenous people who kind of tried to stop them coming in, took them as slaves, um, which they generally did take the natives as slaves and then turned Australia into a convict kind of colony. And brought their convicts over and we began from there. So British law was brought into Australia when that all happened. So Aboriginals displaced and their laws weren't recognised under the conquest laws. And there was a famous case in 1832 about an Aboriginal who under tribal law, um, basically some guy who'd broken the law, they speared this guy eight times or something. And it went to court for assault or for serious grievous bodily harm and the Aboriginal argued, well, hang on a sec, you know, I was on the tribal law. We we're allowed to operate. And it was held in the court, as you would unfortunately expect, like, hey, you know, in 1788, we took over. It became white Australia or it became a whatever it became, English law Australia. Therefore, English Australia now says Aboriginal law comes under us. Our law says that that's grievous bodily harm. Therefore, our law says you go to jail. And that was a flexing its muscle. So. High Court, as I mentioned, made a significant um, decision in 1995 where they recognised the connection to the Indigenous people by giving them native title rights, which although it wasn't the same as freehold rights, it, it, it meant that there were certain limitations on certain land 
where native title or ongoing connection to the land could be proved. So the big myth to understand, this is one of the big things on the internet, is that all English law was adopted automatically at Federation. Not entirely true. Although to a degree that was true, a lot has changed over the last 200 years. And it's also important to realize that it was always recognized that if the colony changed the laws under the delegated English authority, but that would override any original English law. And the, high, and the courts in Australia have by and large said the Magna Carta wasn't carried over. So as one, one example, unfortunately, as much as I would like the Magna Carta to be part of our law, and I, there are people who've argued it, and I've read the arguments, and I think that I wouldn't say they're completely invalid, but as the law stands right now, the high court, the courts have said that doesn't apply in Australia. Um, in any event, it is now accepted by and large in the international community, Australia is a sovereign independent country from the UK. Now in saying that, that may be the case um, legal, um, it, practically, but legally it's an absolute mess. Like I remember when I did constitutional law at university in the um, 1990s, and I can remember our lecturer, who's one of the best constitutional laws, just saying it's an absolute mess. He said it really is. My father, David Black, Professor David Black, is actually one of Australia's top political analysts and um, constitutional experts. So I was very fortunate. I've always been able to bounce off my father. And I was actually hoping to get him to come along tonight, but he's just got out of hospital. So he's by and large okay. But I thought I'd just give him a bit more time and then I was going to get him on another webinar, um, hopefully. I mean, he, he's he been on TV and all that kind of stuff a lot in his life, but... I, would, I won't be able to get him on a webinar unless I'm sitting in the room with him and making sure I put the camera on him direct. So anyway, we've discussed all these issues as well. Um, my father's knowledge of elections and ability to predict election results is actually quite legendary. Um, I've been able to meet um, various politicians through my father, including the West Australian current Premier, uh, Mark McGowan, who I met him in Parliament House four and a half years ago with my father in the lunchroom. So it's interesting when you kind of are there, you meet them and things like that. So our, our law is a bit of a mess right now. And in saying that there was enough rights in our constitution, which is why governments have brought the state of emergency in. So I'm gonna do my best to, to teach you how it actually works, but just keep in mind, it's not, if you, if you walk away having some idea but thinking I don't understand everything, you know, please excuse me, but I think even most constitutional experts would still say, well, we're not entirely sure on certain things. So there are some things I can tell you, for example, our foundations of our legal system in Australia are right from the Holy Bible, you know? So they, from the Old Testament, there was a law of Moses and the common law of England came also directly from the law of Moses. The the law of the Ten Commandments, to love your neighbor, the golden rule, things like that. And it's amazing when you go and study it. When you go into the courtroom, you'll notice that until some years ago, you had to swear on the Holy Bible. Um, don't know if anyone remembers those days. You still do now, but you have the option to take an oath, um, which is not basically the Holy Bible. The, the Freemasons Lodge, they have a Holy Bible as their main book. So most um, courts, organizations are extremely aware about the legal foundations from the Bible and how it actually works. So the common law, the golden law was life, liberty, property. That was the original law of England. And it actually came from the law of Moses and from the Bible, the whole idea of laws by and large um, in common law is that, is that the, the premise or assumption of it is that you can by and large do what you want provided when you're living in a civilized society, you value the life, the liberty and property of other people. So you, I, I just can't turn up and just take your car for a spin. Um, or I can't just decide one day that, you know, I'm, an ancient, I'm, I'm thinking like an ancient, you know, caveman and I go, oh, and I see a, a woman that I like. So I go grab her and take her into my house and lock her in there. That's, that's, a, that's a deprivation of liberty. Um, I killing people as well under the common law. Um, unlawful killings were prohibited 
not killing entirely because killing in self-defense or certain killing in the was was permitted like if it's for the higher good like let's say that a country is coming in to invade you or something like that but that's the reason that common law existed um in the first place it was to define definition to these principles that everyone kind of knew was common sense but to make sure that people didn't just make up their own law they wanted to create a common law that's why what's been, I think, incredibly detrimental to our society over the last 20 years is this whole idea that everyone can just do what they want whenever they want, which is just fallacy. It's not correct in ancient society. It's not correct in any religious understanding. It's not even correct in any, you know, scripture, other teaching or any of the um, religions of any kind anywhere. So it's meant to give principles and definition. In other words, think of it like a broad boundary, but it's still a boundary. That was the idea of common law. So, as we mentioned here, um, so before 1901, what's really important with Australia, so after, feather, after basically England turned up and that here, bit by bit, the various colonies, which of course became the states, ended up um, becoming New South Wales, there was Victoria, then there was Tasmania, 1829 West Australia came in after um, a few of these others. And so eventually you had these different ones and then you had the territory. So they all ran independently and had their own laws and all did their own thing by and large. And around about the 1880s and 1890s, the question started to arise, should we have some kind of federal or independent entity? Because by that stage, the US had done it. They'd set up a federation or a federal United States um, in the 1865, 1870 odd. And they, and of course, by their constitution, so they said, let's, should we have a federation to govern the colonies? Now, understanding this history is critically important. If you understand this history, the constitution will make sense. It, a, lot of what, a lot of what you hear and learn today will make a lot of sense. And even if you don't understand everything, it will make sense. And generally, it's because of lack of knowledge that people get into trouble. So the biggest dilemma that was going on was the general feeling among everyone was a federation was needed. In other words, something to represent Australia's interests with the rest of the world. Because by Australia was like, we don't like being this kind of Britain's bitch, which is kind of what they were. Like in the 1800s, pretty much Britain would, would come in on their boats, make sure that their naughty um, you know, slaves were behaving themselves and then they would get back on their boats and go back. And as time went on, the Australians fall, well, hang on a sec, we've developed a bit beyond the prison camp now, and we really should have some kind of independence from Britain. Now, Britain were obviously reluctant to say, oh, we don't know, we don't want to let you loose. Um, we want to maintain some control. So various debates and discussions came about. On top of the fact that Britain were umming and ahhing how much control they wanted to relinquish, the colonies were very concerned that a federation would, would take away their power and they'd become like rubber stamp useless. So WA, New South Wales, all of them. WA especially, and I mean, those of you who think WA is a bit of a renegade state, you'll kind of laugh as you'll hear just the history of WA. WA was the most one who was very uncomfortable with a Commonwealth or Federation. And if you actually read the constitution, as you'll see shortly, West Australia won't even mention it originally because West Australia refused initially to be part of it. And the reason why was West Australia was doing really well with economically, it had more resources than the other states, it had gold, and it was concerned that it would be disadvantaged by coming into a federation because the other, the other states would, would benefit off them, which is exactly what's happened today. And, you know, not, not much has changed in 120 years, I'm sure you would all agree. Um, WA is still whinging about that and, um, to this day. So the... In the end, the discussions went something along the lines of, look, we really have to meet this kind of mutual compromise between Britain's interest, who doesn't want to lose their slaves um, straight away. Um, we don't want the Commonwealth to basically take over the states and make them, you know, useless. And at the same time, there's no point making the Commonwealth a completely useless, non-effective um, rubber stamp, you know, representative. So we've got to make some kind of system that means the Commonwealth has its own identity. The states have their own identity and Britain still ultimately has some involvement in what's going on. And that, that's the background behind the Federation. I mean, who, by the way, did not know that at all? My guess is quite a few of you. That, that was the background behind it. 
So yeah, my guess is this is probably new and quite enlightening to many. So uh, it makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Why we've got our crazy government systems all doing their different things when you realize that. So when the Federation was born, um, Australia remained a territory of Britain. They made this thing called the Commonwealth Constitution. And um, the states, by the way, in the meantime, had also created their constitutions. So WA's got one too, the WA Constitution Act. Um, Victoria's got their own constitution. Um, New South Wales, they've all got one. And generally all of them were created before the Commonwealth created theirs. There's so many things about this, like even taxes, the states were doing all the taxes at one stage and the Commonwealth then took over the taxing, which as we see today. So um, things like that. So it was always intended for Commonwealth not to supplant the um, other states or whatever else. So anyway, um, it's interesting, I'm sure you would all agree. Okay. So the one state who did not join the Federation was West Australia, as I mentioned. This is a prosperous state with gold resources and refused initially, but joined shortly after Federation. So after 1901, WA changed their mind again and were like, oh, yikes, what have we done? Why on earth did we join this thing? And there were all these debates about leaving, but they couldn't get a referendum through. Now, in 1933, WA decided we'd had enough. They, obviously, the Great Depression, they were watching the mess in the rest of, of, of Australia and the world, so they decided they were going to succeed from the Commonwealth. And they passed a, a referendum successfully to do so. Um, the Commonwealth accepted it. When the bill was taken to UK, UK um, basically refused to acknowledge the bill and blocked it. Now that in itself tells you something interesting. So UK actually stopped the succession from happening. So there are people who are trying to argue that Australia left UK at 1901. That one fact alone tells you that didn't really happen. So it's really hard to say. And I remember our constitutional law lecturer when we we're at uni, I remember someone asked him, he, said, he actually said, honest truth is no one actually knows. And some would argue we still haven't. That was his response, but he would say, I think it's safe to say we probably are in practical terms, but he said, these are the different possibilities that have been flagged. Um, 1908, 1933, uh, I personally don't think either of those two were the case. 1984, the Australia Act was the big law that was passed to try and make it really clear once and for all that we were separate from the UK. And to be really sure about it, Bob, um, the Australian Bob Hawke and the government, they went ahead, they drew up this act, they passed the law in Australia, and they even asked England to pass the law as well, just to be safe, and England passed the law. But the constitutional law fraternity's theory is they think that act is a bigger mess than the rest of it. So there are some who argue that we still belong to Britain, and that even though practically we now are separate, that we legally still belong to Britain. My personal view is that we probably are. And when I've read the constitution, I think we still are. Now, I think practically, I doubt any court would enforce that, but I think on the, if you read the strict law, we are still part of UK. We're, just still, we're still a colony to this day. That hasn't changed. Um, you can see it, especially in the Whitlam dismissal. Um, some of you who are you know, old enough to know about this may remember this extraordinary situation when Gough Whitlam was the Labour President of Australia, Prime Minister of Australia. Um, he was the ScoMo of that time. And Whitlam was a bit of a radical. He, he was a, a, quite a strong um, socialist. He charged high taxes. He, um, he, gave, he started giving money away. He brought in free education to Australia. Um, he was doing a whole lot of radical things. And in the end, the party, even his own party got frustrated with him. Um, and basically, they start, what happened was he got blocked supply. Now, that, now to try and explain about blocking supply, it, it's a bit like what happened last year in UK, in US, where the parliament actually refuses to pass a bill letting you spend money. Because the way the constitutions work, governments can't spend your money 
um, all your taxes without passing what's called an appropriations bill. And generally it's rubber stamp. Like let's say ScoMo says, hey, we've got to, we've got to, you know, we've got to spend um, $5 billion to give a COVID disaster relief thing. What ScoMo has to do is they have to draft up an appropriations bill, go into court and, or parliament and they get the bill passed um, as an example. So what happened was that the politician just said, no, we're not passing your law. So basically Whitlam could not um, govern because he couldn't get any money. Now you could only imagine what that was like. The same was happening last year a bit with Donald Trump um, with the Democrats. And I don't know if any of you remember that when there was, you know, periods of time when they couldn't actually get any money out. Um, and here was where it got extraordinary. It's quite an um, a, a incredible history. But what happened was they, um, was they really, a lot of the politicians said, we want Whitlam out, but Whitlam refused to leave and his party refused to basically, um, you know, fire him. But Whitlam, but Whitlam because the, the upper house, you'll learn more about that shortly, the, um, the upper house basically, um, this is a very simplified version of what happened, but they, they basically, because they couldn't get money, so some people went to Sir John Kerr, who was the Governor General, and you'll learn more about that shortly what I mean. And the Governor General is actually the guy in charge of Australia, and you'll see that shortly, not the politicians. And that's what basically they said to him. You're actually in charge of Australia because you're the Governor General. You're basically the King or the Queen of Australia. And of course, he was uncomfortable, and he said, well, that's true. But in practice, we never do anything. And he goes, you can fire Whitlam if you want to. And he said, well, I'd really rather not do that. But he went to Garfield Barwick, who was the Chief Justice of the High Court in, in secret, and asked him, and he went through the Constitution, and Barwick confirmed. Um, there was a lot of controversy over that, because Barwick didn't particularly like um, Whitlam at all, so he was very glad to see the back of him. But um, John Kerr then sensationally um, fired uh, Whitlam by basically dissolving both House of Parliament. In other words, he shut down Parliament and ordered a new election. Um, now you can imagine the chaos that happened. Interestingly, John Kerr, almost, all, years later, almost went mentally insane, the story goes, because he led sleepless nights wondering if he'd done the right thing. But there's no doubt, as my father and I, who talked, my professor father, that Whitlam, the, the Whitlam dismissal by John Kerr was 100% correct in law, even though in practice, it was like uh, incredible. So in actual fact, if, if, you, if the people didn't like ScoMo enough, we could get him fired. That's basically what I just said. And you could get all the parliament dissolved and get every single politician kicked out if you actually wanted to. If enough people did that and forced the governor general's hand, parliament could be shut down and ended and new politicians done. I remember this happening, not, not in the federal level, but in the local councils years ago, um, when we had a situation like this in the council, a similar thing, and they actually dissolved the whole council. Now, in practice, that would be incredible if that happened, but the whole Commonwealth government could be basically um, dissolved. Um, some similar issues the state constitutions. Now, in practice, don't get too excited about doing anything about that, because that would take a spiritual reformation of incredible levels. You know, that would take a if on incredible levels, because in a way, no one ever wanted a repeat of the Whitlam situation. But just wanted to show you, you know, that in all the bad things you'll be hearing about the law, there are some little loopholes that do exist. And one of them is that, that is a law. That the right now, that is why, by the way, in 1999, they were so desperate to pass a republic because the republic would have ended this, whereas that failed. And that's why they really wanted a republic. That's why Turnbull wanted a republic, because they know that while they got the current constitution, by and large, the recognition, as you'll see shortly, of Almighty God and the monarchy and the English common law background and certain abilities of the people to protect if things get too bad are still are in that constitution. So constitutions were passed to protect the rights of the people. So if you look at the history of constitutions of any kind, they came about to stop government overreach. Now, I'm not going to go into um, past awakenings and collapses before. Um, that's going to be next week, in the uh, so to speak. But the Magna Carta came in because King John was over, overreaching his power over the people and over the barons of the land. 
The Bill of Rights came in because of an extraordinary situation with William Penn, um, which I'll be talking about quite a lot over the next four weeks, the William Penn case, which is quite an incredible case that shows you what the people can do when you have a religious or spiritual awakening to coincide with a political awakening. Um, so the William Penn case can show you what can be done when the people really wake up. When I say really wake up, really wake up um, spiritually, get get their priorities right back with Almighty God, however that looks. Now, just to be clear, I'll be teaching more on spiritual awakening in another webinar. I use Almighty God and use the Christian basis because in Australia, most people identify with that. If I was speaking in India, for example, I probably would speak more from the Hindu or Kriya Yoga background because the they identify with that. So our constitution and the American constitution and the English constitution and bills are all in recognition of both. So they all came into the, the force for the same reason. The US constitution came in because they were horrified about the horrors of what this British um, empire had done to them and they never want to happen again. The Commonwealth of State came in to give similar things, but there was one thing I'll emphasize here that Australia doesn't have. And a number of my learned friends mentioned this with frustration. That Australia is probably one of the only Western states that has no Bill of Rights whatsoever. Like we don't have one. Um, America has one, England has one, Canada has one, New Zealand has one, we don't. Why? <clears throat> Again, you heard the background of Australia, we're a convict colony. In 1900, we still, England regarded us as their kind of little empire, which they ran. The last thing they wanted to do was give their um, colonies too many rights. So, hence Australia doesn't really have a Bill of Rights. Some would argue, like I said, the Magna Carta came in, but like I said, I do think that that hasn't been held until now. And I think for that to be changed, you'd require a very similar situation to what happened to bring in the Magna Carta and bring in the Bill of Rights in Australia. Both those events were brought in by a spiritual awakening by key people in society, like business people, um, you know, the more the important people, and then demanding political change. So the constitutional rights can only be suspended by mutual contract or agreement, like you join the military, maybe business, or da -da 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 -da, you have a state of emergency. And therein, my friends, lies the reason that they've been so keen to have a state of emergency. No doubt you probably already knew that, um, or many of you did, but because that by and large suspends a lot of the protections that do exist. So the common law in simple terms, as I mentioned, was life, liberty, property, civil, admiralty, martial, dictatorship, um, and only for times of extreme emergency. So Australia, we have a democracy. Who's, who's enjoying this so far or who's fighting it heavy? Just let me know how you're going with it all. I know it's pretty heavy. Hopefully, I'm, I'm doing my best to make it as simple as possible. Hopefully, uh, you know, getting some of it at least. Heavy but great. Excellent. Well, well done for sticking through it. I mean, it's important um, learning. So, and like I said, Ignorance is the reason that we're in this mess. And really governments rely on the stupidity of their people. Another reformation I'll talk about next week is the Catholic Reformation when they were kind of pushed out by the Protestants. And that was a classic situation when a Catholic church maintained control over the people for 700 years by managing to keep people um, ignorant to the, to the Bible. So for example, they actually, it was illegal for anyone to own a Bible other than a priest. And the Bible had to be in Latin. I don't know if anyone knew that. But the whole reformation that happened in England, and the reason why England had the Bill of Rights and Common Law was because um, they had to fight hard just to get the right to a Bible on their table. So that's why they so valued that and valued their holy books um, because the Catholic Church blocked them from doing it because they did not want the English people to know their spiritual authority or power. So... Um, my dad was also a history expert and I carried on from him about, I love history. You know, I like to study everything about history I can find out. So we follow the Westminster model of government. It's not the same as the US. Um, we're much more like England. So let's just go a little bit more back into the UK system um, and things like that. So the, in the UK, 
the monarch had supreme power until the 1600s. The monarch was advised by a parliament who represented the people, but, um, you know, but maintained authority at all times. So, basically, this is why if you go back over English history, you'll read about the various kings, and the kings pretty much had supreme power. The reason that parliaments came into being was they were, um, you know, was parliaments were basically, um, you know, so basically what happened is that um, parliaments basically um, came in, the monarch was advised by parliament, who represented the people, but maintained authority at all times. So, let me just, who's here been a big fan of history? Okay. Yeah, different people. Great. So, abuses by King Charles was what changed things. So the parliament was like the councillors or the ministers. So what the kings would actually do would, um, the kings would actually get this parliament like a council, a bit like a business, like me having a business, for example, on my own, if I'd had that, and I might have a council of people, or like the CEO of a company has a board of directors or whatever I'm else. So um, the abuses by King Charles in the 1600s result in parliament revolting. The result was parliament became the supreme authority. So this, so basically the parliament basically pushed back and they forced the king in the end to listen to them and in the end, the parliament, and now to this day, um, England, basically, the parliament, by and large, rules that Cappy correctly says, yeah, a lot of history has been deleted. It took me a lot of study in the underground movement and going right back through books to find this out. So I noticed a couple of people giving, you know, saying that's rubbish what you're saying. So I just removed them from the webinar. And I don't mind if people respectfully say, you know, they've heard different and they want it explained. But yeah, like I said, you know, anyone who's on here, you're welcome to do your own webinars. In fact, I'd strongly encourage you that, to go and help others. But yeah, on my webinar, um, just want to get on. And like I said, with my sources, someone's asked, absolutely. You know, happily um, over the next four to five weeks and others, it'll take time to learn this. It took me years. You know, when I went into the underground movement, I had to really work to learn this stuff. I had to, I had to study hard. I had to get access to books that were hard to get hold of. Um, it wasn't easy. So Sarah said, I love you, you delete the naysayers. Yeah, look, I'll just explain the reason I just do that is, look, I respect people's opinions. I mean, my own family, to give you all an idea, most of them have different views to me, like on the on the jabs and on, on everything else. And we actually get on well because we're just fine with each other. And I really don't have a problem with someone, um, you know, having a different view to me. And if someone goes out and does a class or teaching with different views, yeah, look, if you got proof to back it, great. If I can see I'm clearly wrong, I'm curious to find out. It's just, I, it's the tone. I, I find when people give a certain tone in a question and have a bit of a smart ass know it all, I just don't have time for that. And it disrupts everyone else who's trying to listen. So I just, yeah, get rid of them. That's my basic rule, makes life easy for everyone. So, um, so the result was, so when Australia was settled, they pretty much followed by and large exactly um, the same model. So this responsible thing. In other words, the king, the idea of having a king or queen, but the king or queen by and large was just the lame duck. If you look at the royal family today, they really are. Like, I mean, the queen doesn't really have a lot of power. They're just kind of this like status symbol and the royal family. The parliament by and large really, 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 you know, own, um, control England. And it's the same here. So the governor general, think of the governor general as a bit like, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth, that she's the, she's basically Queen Elizabeth's representative in Australia. So the present Governor General right now of Australia um, is a guy called David Hurley. So I'll just get his picture up. So that's him right now. So that's the guy according to the Constitution who technically is in charge of our country right now. So if you thought it was ScoMo, meet your boss. Um, I'm being facetious, obviously, that's only technically legally, but as we know, with the Biosecurity Act, and as Whitlam found out, to his detriment, 
the governor general does have the ultimate say. So you'll learn more about the governor general and what they actually do. So, like I said, it's all very, very interesting. Yeah, more like a figurehead, Carleen, is correct. So the constitution, now I want to go through and show you some provisions or extracts. So again, heavy, I, I, I get. So notice West Australia is the obvious submission, as I mentioned, this is quoting directly, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal government under the um, crown of the United Kingdom. Notice that it's under the crown. Now the crown is by and large, that's just like the whole English common law, the English government, the English system of law. So that means coming under that system. And where is expedient to provide for the admission of the Commonwealth, um, it is therefore enacted by with the advice of the Lord spiritual and temporal and commons as it follows. Okay. So that's what it's, so notice this. So notice the words. With humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God. Now, as I said, just so just to, 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 to explain one thing about this. When I was involved in the church and was a little bit more what I call a very hardcore Christian, I remember being very excited by this. And I, you know, and then I started to explore and look into all other things and things like that. And I ended up coming around reasonably full circle and that I realized the power of what was actually being said here and understanding. Because one thing I noticed when I studied countries that had relied on the blessing of Almighty God and a call that into their country, generally were the most prosperous and, and the most highest civil liberties in the world. And it quite surprised me when I found all this out. Some of you know Wayne Glue, who teaches this same kind of stuff and found out the same thing. Um, just about anyone who does this, and I have had business contacts who, you know, one guy who virtually all but told me he was an atheist 10 years ago, now is pretty much um, saying to me, well, the more I've studied the, the law and the constitution, which he did himself, he said, I've realized that we've got a very strong Christian or spiritual biblical heritage in Australia. And that's what's been, that's what's given us a lot of our rights. Countries that don't have that don't have much identity. Like China, for example, don't have that kind of identity. Whereas we still do. Now they frantically trying to take this away, and that was why they tried a republic. They've done a few weird things in our laws in WA and in Queensland and other places, but by and large, we still have this. Um, that is why this state of emergency, which is brought in, they don't want to drop this state of emergency because once they drop this, there's a lot of things they can't actually do. So, let, so here's the first provision. So I'll explain these, don't worry. But section one, legislative power, I just want to quote the provisions exactly so you can see the evidence for yourself. Um, so um, the legislative power, Shayla asked what I think of Wayne. Look, Wayne's doing his thing or whatever. I don't go along with Wayne's approach, but, you know, I appreciate Wayne, you know, if, for him doing his path. And if he can make some kind of a difference, then good on him. You know, that's how I see Wayne. I've met him. He's a lovely guy. As I said, I don't follow his approach. And my understanding, he hasn't had a lot of success in what he's doing. But like I said, you know, anyone who's out there trying to make a difference, good on them. That's my approach with him. So the legislative power, um, which shall consist of the Queen, a Senate and a House of Representatives. So that's the power to make laws. The Governor General shall be Her Majesty's representative appointed by the Queen. Notice those words. So the Governor General appointed by the Queen shall be Her Majesty's representative. In other words, will be the delegated king. Now, the best way to think of this is in the ancient Roman Empire time, Caesar, um, when Rome took control of the world bit by bit, what they did was, let's just say that Rome, when Rome conquered Israel, for example, um, the Jewish um, Hebrews people, um, they, they would appoint what's called procurators or representatives to be king of that region underneath them. So, when you read the Bible about Herod, for example, Herod was a delegated king under Caesar, very much similar to what the governor general is under the king or queen. So that's the best way to think of it, like a delegated king. So it's like um, Brit the British Empire had the queen and the royal family, then they're delegated. I remember reading 20 years ago, this is a complete potential conspiracy theory, so I will, I will say that, so don't take me on this one. But I remember, remember for a bit of fun in the underground movement researching a lot of books and 
I, I, I actually personally am convinced that US is technically owned by Britain as well. Um, I'm not, whether I'm right or not, I'm not entirely sure, but I found a lot of evidence to suggest that they actually were. And that the British um, Empire, when it took control of the world from the city of London, still controls a lot of the countries of the world indirectly through their documents and constitutions because they haven't really been changed. So it's, it's an interesting situation legally well, worldwide. So the Governor General is kind of like represents the um, Queen or whatever else. So yeah, look, it seems unlikely. I'm inclined to agree, but there was evidence I found that, that had me intrigued, but I never really explored it because I was more interested in focusing on my own country. So, um, so section one, the one which I mentioned here, this is the simple way to understand how our government works. And this is really important to get this, even if you don't get a lot else. Um, so executive, legislative, judiciary. So I'll try and think about explain this. The executive are the politicians who administer the law and run the country day to day, like cabinet. So SCOMO, um, the cabinet. So the guys who are in the cabinet, like the treasurer, um, what's his name, Freidenberg. Um, the um, Michaela Cash, who's the minister for women, I think she is. SCOMO, who's the um, PM. Um, Peter Dutton, who's the minister for home affairs. Their cabinet. So what happens is that, as you'll see, there's like 151 politicians in the um, lower house of government, which I'll go through more shortly. But only like a small number of them, like 10, 15 or whatever, go on the cabinet. And they're what's called the executive who run the country. So they exercise management power. Now, so that's, so what happens is that, Sco, so ScoMo, um, Freidenberg and these other guys all get into a secret room and have private cabinet meetings and make decisions on Australia. Um, you may have noticed that, um, you know, um, um, Macau was attorney general. Okay, yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure anymore. So you've got like um, ScoMo and all these people. You may even notice that there's now a national cabinet, which has got the state premiers and um, SCOMO, which is kind of goodness knows what that is. But the cabinet for the Commonwealth government is the executive. These are the ones who make the day-to-day -day administration of the law. They can't pass laws at the cabinet. They can only pass mandates or directives or policies or regulations or procedures. And that's important to get. So the state of emergency, for example, and a classic example, the legislation that gives the power to make their directives and their mandate to say you've got to put a mask and get an anal swab up your ass or whatever, or whatever they, you know, horrific stuff they decide to bring in, they've got to get legislative power under the constitution to do it. So the state of emergency, you will notice they, they keep passing it to the parliaments. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that the Commonwealth government can't really do that. So they've got the states doing it. So all the states have passed state of emergencies. Um, and, but, the, but it's critical to understand, but they could not do a state of emergency unless they did that. And the Commonwealth as such hasn't necessarily passed one either. So they've implemented the Biosecurity Act. So legislative are the parliamentarians who make laws. So there's two houses in Australia. So what I want to do just quickly is I'll show you something. Um, I'll, I'll do a diagram for you shortly on the screen to show you how this works. So and the judiciary are the courts who interpret the law. So the easy way to think of it is the executive are the police who administer day to day. They give their mandates, give their directives, get up and bleat on television. Um, the legislative are the people who turn up in the parliament and pass legislation and give them your fight. And, and then they say what's allowed because they represent the people. So they say, this is what you're allowed to pass laws in relation to. This is what you're not allowed to pass laws in relation to. So that's what actually happens there. The um, judiciary are the ones who, let's say that the laws are unclear and someone's arguing that say this law shouldn't apply or like Clive Palmer is arguing that the law is unclear or the directive is unclear, then he will go to the courts to interpret the legislation, like argue like, is Mark McGowan allowed to shut us out at the border? Or is, and that's like an interpretation of the law. Or 
like Nathan Buckley of GNB Lawyers right now, who's got a class action on the aged care mandatory vaccination. He's trying to argue that the um, Commonwealth have got no authority to mandate a vaccination for anyone. And um, the states are prohibited from doing it as well for various reasons. I have my reservations whether his case will succeed, but I'll cover that shortly. Um, so that's the important things to understand. So let me just do a bit of a diagram for you um, to just show you. So I'm going to do a new share briefly. Um, I'm going to do this whiteboard. So hopefully you can see that. So what you've got here is that. So you've got the... Um, Three arms of government. Let's just do here. Um, so what this is here is So is that, and then over here, so the House of Reps, Senate. Okay. So that's the simple diagram. So what is this in simple terms saying to you? Um, let me just say this first. So the executive are the people who make the laws like SCOMO, so cabinet. In fact, let's just say that here. No, I won't do it now. So you got the cabinet like, actually now I can do it here. No, I can't. Okay. So what you've got here is you've got like the cabinet making the decisions. You've got the House of Parliament that makes the laws and you've got the judges. Okay. Now there's two houses. So each one is a different function. This is the group who make the laws and whoever controls this controls government. That's the best way to think of it. So right now, ScoMo and his team control that place. Very, very by the skin of their neck, by the way, like by the absolute skin of their teeth, as you'll see shortly. But they barely control this place. They they just have enough right now to pass laws. So um, they pass the laws. Now, once they pass the laws, they then have to give them over to the Senate. Now, the Senate, just to be clear, they can't initiate law. So if you're a senator, like Malcolm Roberts is a senator, who some of you have seen his videos, he can't initiate a new law, but he can block a law. So if enough people control the Senate, so let's just say next election, like Craig Kelly, Pete Evans, um, and a whole lot of really good politicians got control of the Senate or One Nation, um, that would mean that they could not pass their laws without doing them properly because they couldn't get them through, they'd be blocked basically at the center. So at the moment, there's enough um, at, at the Senate, which the Liberals and the others are involved in to get laws actually through and the two major parties. So the Senate is the ones that are the, are the checks and balance. And you'll see what the difference is. It's quite significant and you'll see why they did it this way. So so what I'll do now is I'll stop that share. What I'll do just. Show in folder. Okay, yeah, got it here just in case I need it. Okay. So let me just put it here. Um, 
government's diagram just so i've got it there if i need it again so um new share so i'll stop this a new share back to my screen share okay is everyone following that um at all yep yeah, starting to make sense that's good so that's how that works now so let's just go through the legislation like i said so the governor general that section two which i gave you which was back here the governor general what this does here it, it effectively continues the monarchy and i've told this story about that so right now we still have a monarchy in australia despite what anyone tells you so we're actually a monarchy in australia which means that um the governor general is the guy who runs the show this david hurley dude even though in practice he does nothing and just does what he's told um the the parliament basically uh, it's effectively the governor general is is doing um lizzie's job over here um the parliament the house of reps and that um are the ones who run the country but the parliament that the house of reps and whoever controls that actually runs the country now let's just go through this a bit more um let's look first at this lower house what scomo controls and why scomo is right now in government okay um so that's the lower house for you you've got the government will sit in one spot the opposition and the independents and minor parties and they sit there and debate and yell at each other and do whatever so this is a section 24 of the constitution that says how it works so they pass the laws now notice the words directly chosen by the people so the purpose is that the people in a democracy decide who's basically going to represent them so in other words they decide who's going to be the rep so like let's say for example in west australia where i live there's a representative for our area and there's a representative for something else when this when this was passed by the way it wasn't ever meant to contemplate a party system the party system kind of came in a bit later it was meant to do more members and the best thing about a parliament is when you've got a diversified group of people because then it forces a law and i've always said the best government we could have in australia is to have a broad range of politicians have some labors have some liberals have some one nations have some independents and have such a broad diverse range of people have some animal justice have some shooters and fishers have such a broad range of people but no major party gets even close to controlling it because that will force everyone to grow up and do things correctly and not do the kind of shit that they do um so they keep it yeah so it's set up to keep people honest by having a diverse diversity so it was actually meant to, to have inclusivity and diversity so that no one got sort of bulldozed it's why in the u.s system and this is beside the point but i get amazed when people go on about how unfair the electoral house um system is in america when you actually study it it's designed to make sure that the smaller states don't get bullied by the bigger states it allows the, the, the little ones not to be overtaken otherwise america would be would be ruled by california so there's a big concern that new south wales for example would dominate the government and the as you'll see shortly the senate was set up to ensure that new south wales couldn't effectively dominate the government so the number of members chosen shall be in proportion now here's the big difference to the senate so the house of reps the, Sco the scomo's place where he governs from the number of parliamentarians or politician um you know guys and girls you've got depends on the size of the state and you'll see shortly how that works unlike the senate which is designed for equal representation you'll see why so the senate exists to stop say new south wales dominating the government or victoria and it makes sure that even tasmania gets a huge say in what goes on in the federation so that's how it's meant to work um the lawmaking so this goes through and explains how it will work um and i'll show you the numbers so right now there's 151 members in the house of reps um that's how it works every election new south wales they vote 47 um politicians in they vote 39 for victoria 30 from queensland in wa we get 15 where i live uh in south australia they get 10 tasmania get five act3 and the northern territory get one wonderful um member so by and large the smaller states don't really have any say in what laws get put up so tasmania act and, and northern territory and even south australia and to a lesser extent wa don't get a lot of say 
So the features is like I said, it's the only house which can draft it. They govern the house. You've got to have 76 members to have government. So, um, well, in principle, Nicole, they determine how many based on proportional numbers. Like I know New South Wales has got, say, 6 million people and WA's got 2 million. So it's three times as many. So therefore, New South Wales has got about three times as many as WA. So it's to do a population at any one time. Um, so because it's 151, there's 76 um, me members. And the reason it's 76 is really simple. Um, I'll show you on a calculator, but as you'll see in the Google calculator, 76 divided by 151 is greater than 50%. So that means that, um, yeah, so greater than the Liberals, for example, the interesting situation right now where Craig Kelly has left the party, which means they only have 75, but he's still by and large votes with them. So occasionally there's a hung parliament where no party has enough to govern. This only happened once since World War II. So I don't know if anyone remembers the 2010 election with Ronald McDonald's um, sister, Julia Gillard, but um, <clears throat> this is what happened in the election. So Labor only could get 73 seats with the Greens. <clears throat> the coalition could only get 73. Um, and there were all 70 basically um, and the independents were basically four. And um, hang on, no, that doesn't quite work. I got that one wrong somewhere. I missed one. Um, yeah, so the coalition was 74. Um, I've missed one somewhere. But anyway, I think it was. Um, so what happened was there were 74. So the general feeling was that the independents would all go with the coalition, but they didn't. So that was how. Uh, so basically, Julia Gillard <coughs> ruled, but she ruled by. Um, but her government, for those who remember, she really couldn't get a lot done because she relied entirely on these independents passing her laws. So that would be a wonderful situation if that happened again. And this election and that neither major party ruled. The upper house, this is the checks and balances. So this goes through, this is the constitution, what it says. Um, it's six year terms, unlike the House of Reps, which is three years term, it's six years terms. <clears throat> so every election, they only do half the senators each time. So the senators once in are in for six years. Now listen again, so notice the difference here. Even Tasmania has the same as New South Wales. So why do you think that would be? The answer is simple. <clears throat> it's to make sure that Tasmania doesn't get bullied by the big states. So let's just say that there's a law which passes that's very unfavorable to Tasmania. Well, if the Tasmanian senators don't like it, they can all block the law. So that's the purpose of that. So they don't govern, but they review legislation requires 39 votes to do. Um, it's, so it's, it's very hard to get control of the Senate because of the way the laws work and the preferences. But if a major party can get control of both of the um, of the houses they can pretty much do what they want john howard at one election had that mark mcgowan in west australia right now controls both houses and the reason why was that the liberals were so appalling that he won in a landslide election i think he owns wa's got 59 seats in their house and he owns 53 of them which is it's insane and he also controls our upper house so mark mcgowan right now could pass whatever law he wanted to and no one can stop him so senators are meant to stop that, but if you have an overwhelming vote, that's what happens. So, example in the 2010 election, same deal. Um, Labor ended up controlling the Senate because they had the nine Greens. In Victoria last year, I don't know if any of you remember it, but when Daniel Andrews was having a lot of trouble getting his state of emergency passed for six months. And in the end, he got those three um, MPs any any medic, um, Fiona Patton and someone else to agree. So if he hadn't done that, for example, he wouldn't have been able to get a pass. And that's why they were trying to court them. And you may remember he was forced to do a lot of concessions. And that was the reason why. So Senate's are good. They, if you're ever going to go for politics, you all, 
you if you break, you know, you you always got a better chance if you go for the Senate because there's a good chance you can get in um, if you play if you do the right marketing. That's why Pete Evans and um, a few of those guys are going for the Senate <laughs> right now. So. The Commonwealth legislative power, I just thought I'd introduce you. Now, this is an important provision to understand here right now. Um, the Parliament, so I'll try and explain this really simply because this is hard to grasp, but I'll explain it. <clears throat> the way it works at the Commonwealth, okay, state government is, is this. <clears throat> the states can by and large pass whatever laws they want. The Commonwealth can only pass laws if they fall within section 51. So section 51 says what they're allowed to pass laws on. So for example, if section 51 doesn't say you can pass laws on say um, brothels, they can't do it. It's got to be specific. If it says they can't pass laws on taxes, they couldn't do it. Now it does, by the way, unfortunately give them the power to tax. But if it didn't say that, the Commonwealth government wouldn't be able to do it. <clears throat> And it was an argument, I don't know if anyone remembers the GST, but it was unconstitutional at one stage because it was argued it fell outside the power to tax. So you'll see here, for example, section 51. It's got the power to charge taxes, but not to discriminate between states. So for example, the Commonwealth couldn't do an income tax tomorrow and say, we're going to charge more in West Australia because we don't like them and less than everywhere else. They can't do that. So the constitution says you can't do that. So um, then, for example, they can pass military laws. It says in here, they can do laws on quarantine. And that's the big one when it comes to medical treatment, that one. So that's why the states keep wanting to talk to the Commonwealth about quarantine facilities, because they're the ones who can do that. Here's the biggie. This is the one for vaccination that Nathan Buckley is running his argument on. They can do pharmaceutical sickness and hospital benefits. Notice they can, they can pay for funding and treatment, but they can't make laws regarding it. <clears throat> Medical and dental services, but not to authorise civil subscription. In other words, force people to work for the government. So it's a very vague power. It doesn't seem to give them the power to make laws on vaccinations from the way I read this. So, um, it doesn't, so that's just giving you an example of how it works. And that is one of the problems with the mandatory vaccination, as you'll see now. The Commonwealth don't really seem to have power in this area um, we, uh, in relation to this. So that's the provisions there. So the states never wanted to lose their power. So the government, now the key to remember is though, is that the, is that the Commonwealth has complete power over those things, which means that if the states pass a law, that's contrary to that. So let's just say the government, the Commonwealth government passed the law tomorrow saying that no state in Australia is allowed to say, um, run a, a pharmaceutical benefit scheme and it will all be run by the Commonwealth. And then the next day, West Australia went against it and did their own. The Commonwealth could go straight to the High Court and it would be thrown out because the state, the, the state government are going against the Constitution. Where it gets more tricky is if the Commonwealth government passed a law um, very generally about, say, funding vaccination treatments. Does that mean that therefore that only the Commonwealth can legislate on vaccines? And that's basically what um, Nathan Buckley, I know, is looking at doing. So um, things like that. So someone said he's being discredited. Well, anyone good always will be. Um, I've spoken to Nathan. I think he's excellent. I think he's a great guy. And obviously he's going to do crowdfunding to fund his action because it's going to be quite expensive. So I don't have a problem with that myself. I think he's doing a good job. I don't know if I agree with his arguments, but at least he's trying. Um, the executive power uh, of the Commonwealth. Now, this is another very interesting one here. So, this is a lot, so for all of you who think to yourself about where's cabinet mentioned in the constitution, the, and SCOMA and all that, it isn't. Yeah, and this is what gets quite funny. I'll, I'll try to explain this really simply. So it grants power to the Governor General to run Australia. That's what Section 61. So basically it says the Governor General in 61 can be the King of Australia or Queen. 
the Governor General has the power to run Australia. The Governor General, in practice, though, delegates his powers to the political party who wins the lower house. But that's not what the Constitution says he should actually do. Um, the Constitution says, and I'll go back to this one in a minute, is that basically the Governor General um, engages a federal executive council, which means a group of people who, from the, polit from the, from the politicians who works with them. If you ask, well, who's the Federal Executive Council? The argue is they don't really do one anymore. Yeah, they use this thing called the Covenant. So but in practice, that's what has happened. So they're also a lame duck. So in practice, when ScoMo won office, rather than um, Governor... So what should have happened is David Hurley, the Governor General, sets up his own team of politicians to advise him, and ScoMo might have been one of them. And then he says to ScoMo, you can go and represent me. In real life, ScoMo and his team win government. They go to the Governor General and say, hey, we won the election. The Governor General says, OK, and he rubber stamps the win at election time by royal assent. And then every time that ScoMo and his team pass the law in the lower house, it goes to the Senate, they pass the law. But let's say ScoMo passed the law saying um, <clears throat> that we are going to force, you know, aged care people to get vaccinated. It then goes to the um, Senate, who then go, yep, OK, and they sign it off. And it then goes to the Governor General, who goes, OK, and who assents it. So this is how it works. And finally, I won't go too much into that to not lose you, but just suffice to say the judicial power is what gives the High Court the power and the land. So the High Court has authority over the Constitution. In other words, the High Court can turn up, and that's why Nathan Buckley is going to the High Court. He's going to the High Court and saying, hey, guys, um, the Commonwealth government's way out of line here. They're trying to pass this mandatory vaccination crap on aged care people. The Constitution does not allow that, in my opinion. And I want you to confirm by, by a ruling to make the Commonwealth government stop this shit. And if the High Court agree with Nathan Buckley, the Commonwealth government will have no choice but to get rid of the law. So that's a simple way of um, explaining it, if that makes sense. So, okay, I'm going to give everyone, I know, who's, it's pretty heavy, I know, isn't it, everyone? Is everyone surviving? No. Like, and if you're finding it hard to grasp, I recommend you watch this again. Because you should, you really want to understand this. This is your future you're talking about. It really is. And you've got to understand what you're dealing with. I'm sure you're agreeing, this is your future. So... I'm going to give everyone a minute's break. I've got to go to the bathroom, complete my water. I'll be straight back. Now, I'm just going to look at the time because this has gone a bit longer. Before. Okay. So, yeah, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to take a break. I'm going to do this Commonwealth versus State interaction section and run through another part. I'll be finished. I'll make sure I'm finished after 100 minutes. So, say by 7.10 Perth time, 9.10 um, Eastern Standard Time. We'll take questions and then end because I really don't want to overdo it. And we'll make sure that the replay gets out. Like I said, so, okay, so I'll, I'll take a minute's break and be straight back. All right, everyone just looking at the um, comments while Warren's taking his break. Um, looks like everyone is is loving it. Um, and I think probably the, the big lesson for me to come out of it is um, it's never black and white. And you see a lot of keyboard type warriors saying, oh, the states can't do this, the Commonwealth can't do this. But um, it, it um, we never really know until it's tested in a court of law. And, you know, we've heard the saying that the law's an ass um, many times. And, um, you know, we never, we never really know um, what's going to happen, um, you know, until things are tested in a court of law. And that's what um, the likes of Nathan Buckley are doing. Um, and um, 
just reading a couple of questions there. Um, the law is so complicated, agreed. <laughs> That's why I never wanted to be a lawyer. Um, can the reversion process reset constitutional rights? That's way beyond my level of skill uh, and knowledge. Um, yeah, more so legis legislative changes. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, need to go over a lot more. Okay, loving it. Great. Um, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, great. Um, uh, a question there. If the High Court challenge to the Fed's vaccine mandate was successful, couldn't the states then just legislate their own vaccine mandates? Um, I don't believe so. Um, but again, that's uh, a... Um, beyond my pay, my pay grade in, in, in knowledge of law. Um, a couple of questions there about um, recording be available. It will be in about 24 hours and Grace, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, an email is sent to everyone after this um, informing them of when uh, the, the replay is available, but it is about an hour, so about 24 hours before that happens. That yes, that's Grace? right. Yep. That's right, Steve. So we normally um, give give um, 24 hours. We, we, we'll upload this on our YouTube um, profile. And also, of course, you've got the, um, it's on live on Facebook right now. So you can always watch it from there too. But we'll definitely upload it on our uh, The Awakening Within YouTube. Yeah, so hopefully that answers, um, that answers the question there. Um, uh, that's an answer. That's a question for Warren. That one didn't the High Court um, ban mandatory vaccin vaccinations? Um, not. I think he, he actually mentioned that last week, I believe. So um, perhaps we can ask that one when he does get back. And my computer's just frozen. Back. So, okay. All right. So a few, few more complexity of the law. Um, but everyone is really enjoying it. Yep. So, okay. Thank you, everyone. So I was going to quickly touch now. That's, by the way, the worst of it's over now. So the heaviest part's over. The rest of it's not quite so bad now. Um, so Section 109, this is the big one that people talk about. About and Malcolm Roberts of, of um, One Nation did a brilliant video in the last couple of days on this, where he actually went through and dispelled many of the myths, and he pretty much said word for word what I said the other week to people on this: that um, where a state law is inconsistent with Commonwealth law, then the state law is invalid, but only to the extent of the inconsistency. That's what it actually says. So. And the exact words are, the latter shall prevail and the former shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be valid. Now, that's pretty critical because the question, because it's because it's very clear. This is not saying that if the, if the states pass the law that the Commonwealth already has law on, um, it's stating quite the opposite. It's stating that the state law can survive, but it can't basically go in contrary to the Commonwealth. And it's a tie-breaking law. So how does this work in practice? The problem is the High Court has had three different ways of approaching this. So two very narrow ways, one is a broader way. So these are the three tests, and I'll explain in simple terms what they mean. One test is, is it impossible to obey both laws? That was one. So that's a fairly strict test. And on that notice, for example, unless the Commonwealth passed a very, very clear law um, stating that no one could ever do a mandatory vaccination, and even that would be questionable, I'll explain why, um, then, yeah, Section 109 does not apply. Malcolm Roberts' view is the same as mine. We don't think Section 109 applies. Nathan Buckley, I, I, the way I'm reading his arguments, thinks it does. I don't, well, or he's certainly trying to argue it does. The only possible way Section 109 might apply to mandatory vaccinations is does the federal law cover the field? Now, what that means in simple terms is this. There is an argument, this is what Nathan Buckley is saying, but the very fact that the Commonwealth can basically, his argument, number one, the Commonwealth can legislate on vaccinations because of the pharmaceutical benefits case. There was a case in 1945 called the pharmaceutical benefits case. And in that case, there was an implication by Justice Latham 
who I might add, it was a very confusing case. There's lots of judges all having their own opinions, but he seemed to think that the Commonwealth had power to make laws on medical pharmaceutical vaccines. That's what it seems to suggest. So he says, therefore, if the, if the Commonwealth have the power, it doesn't matter if the Commonwealth haven't passed a law forbidding mandatory vaccination. The fact that they got the power to do so means the state aren't allowed to do something um, which goes against it. So, um, so things like that. So someone's saying, I can't quite read this. Um, hang, on. hang on, I'm just trying to read this one here. And there's a question here. I'm trying to read this particular one. But... Yeah, Jackie Dundee challenged Malcolm Roberts on states having the power to make vaccines mandatory. Well, I think the problem is, I don't think it's entirely clear. I, I am inclined to think Malcolm Roberts is correct myself. I think he's right. Um, I know people are, are, are more are living in hope. Those who argue that Malcolm Roberts is wrong are relying on two things. They're relying on the following. So, um, trying to get this here. Now, where is it? I wrote something up here. So, I've lost one of my slides. Sorry about this. Um, I had a slide here which has gone missing, but what it was saying was that there's two things that have got to be actually, actually, no, I know where it is. The slide is somewhere else. Let me just go to it. I know where it is. Okay. So I'll jump straight across to this one. And what I'm going to have to do is in my next class, um, go back and cover the state of emergency and a few of those, because I'm just not going to have time to go through that today and the mandates one. So let's just do this. So this way we can do it properly rather than rush everything through. So this is quite important to a lot of people to understand this. So we may as well take the time. As long as everyone's okay with that, I'll do the other two parts next week. Because like I said, otherwise it'll just be too heavy for everyone. So, okay. So it depends which government you're talking about. So the pharmaceutical benefits case seems to imply that there's no authority in Section 5123A for mandatory medical treatment. It allows funding treatment, but not compelling it, as it is clear by rules. Nathan Buckley's view is that the Commonwealth cannot mandate vaccines um, because of the way that this particular one does here. Um, Malcolm Roberts agrees with him, and he then goes further, though, and says the states are allowed to. So the real question is, is, um, is, that, is can, is that, can the states pass laws mandating vaccines um, if the Commonwealth hasn't passed laws on it? That's what the question is. In other words, does section 109 of the constitution knock that out? Because it says, well, hang on a sec, you can't mandate the vaccine. Basically, um, provide if the Commonwealth haven't passed the law specifically saying that the vaccines must be voluntary, then yeah, the states can basically do it. So that's what Malcolm Roberts is arguing because the Commonwealth his argument is, number one, the Commonwealth can't mandate um, vaccines anyway, so they've got no power to make them mandatory or non-mandatory. In any event, even if they did have that power, they haven't done that. So therefore, his view is the state can pass those laws, and I personally agree with him. I don't see how Malcolm Roberts can be wrong um, without a really um, massive, massive, um, you know, court case for the states, and it's possible. So... This is why the Commonwealth are relying on states to implement the vaccines, because he I, he knows the, the power they've actually got. So, um, Asha said about a meeting the Biosecurity Act. I haven't heard that yet, but it may be possible. WA and Victoria have passed laws allowing mandatory vaccines already. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here has seen um, Section 158.1 of the Public Health Act, but if you haven't, it's probably worth... Um, a bit of a look at in WA in 2016. Um, this is a rather nasty little provision. Um, so this is a mandatory requirement where an authorised officer can give a direction to undergo medical observation, examination or treatment to be vaccinated. And the authorised officer can use reasonable force to ensure 
that the person gets vaccinated. So that's probably the strongest provision you'll ever see in your life. Um, you apprehend and detain the person, take them to a place. In other words, grab them, lock them up, take them down to a quarantine centre, tie them to the bed, um, remove their underwear um, and force the vaccine into their ass. So if you read this legislation, read it for yourself. <laughs> just, now, that wasn't our current premium never passed that, just to be clear. That was passed by um, Colin Barnett, his parting gift to the state of Western Australia, gift wrapped um, before he left. So this wasn't passed by Mark McGowan, just to be very clear, and I highly doubt he would have passed it. Um, but knowing Colin Barnett, and I don't know if anyone who live in WA remember the atrocities of what they were trying to do to our wetlands and environments. Um, but yes, if you read this provision, um, it's like an apocalyptic movie. So they can get you, lock you up, apprehend, detain you for observation, um, take you down to a quarantine centre, restrain you down for an observation, and then remove your underwear and put the vaccination into you, including a child. So, yeah, that's um, a what the fuck. <laughs> so, yeah, that's something which you definitely want the government to be getting off the record book pretty damn fast. That's an outrageous provision. So, Victoria's got something relatively similar. So, for those of us who live in W Victoria, yay. I'm joking, by the way. It's just, I just shake my head. I cannot believe it, but that's what we've got. Um, section 109 only applies to the inconsistent Commonwealth law um, and that kind of stuff here. So you may recall the three tests I, I mentioned there, the broad test, um, the test on the situation. Um, so for the argument to succeed that mandatory vaccination is not allowed, in other words, that they can't actually do that, um, there's two things that must happen. And I, Section 5123 has to be broadly interpreted to say the Commonwealth do have the power and they have exclusive power of back, uh, to make laws and, and legislation on that things. Um, I don't know if it says that myself. I, I, I can't see that in there. And in any event, even if it does say that, they have to apply the third broad test of Section 109, which says that the fact the Commonwealth has got the power to do it means the state can't do it. Whereas there's two other, other interpretations that could say, well, provided they aren't inconsistent, I, I can't see how the third broad test would apply. Um, that's why I said the ugly truth, because um, section 109, in my opinion, is very clear wording. It says to the extent of the inconsistency. So if the Commonwealth haven't passed inconsistent laws of mandatory vaccination, I don't think in any way, shape or form that will succeed. I'd be very surprised if he wins his case, pleasantly surprised. I think he's gonna lose that case. I think that mandatory vaccines are going to be permitted if you, if, and I emphasize the big if, if you trust. Someone says their corporations are unlawful. Well, yeah, but you've got to live in the real world. Um, I, I don't know anyone who's gone into court and won on that one. So, um, yes, they are a corporation, but you've got to work with what you've got and gradually unpeel the layers. So, um, the other one is what about the Nuremberg Code? Um, this states that people should not be subject to experimental medical treatment if they haven't consented to it. The thing is, um, Nuremberg doesn't actually apply in Australia unless it's up in legislation. That's well established. Only the ACT have adopted the Nuremberg Code. So if you want to go live in Canberra in the cold, um, yeah, there is a, a legislative provision <clears throat> which prevents anyone from doing vaccinations on you without informed consent. Um, so this is what you've got. ACT, you've got um, full, um, you got full protection. Uh, surprise, surprise. Victoria and WA, you don't. The other states don't really say anything about it yet. So that's the reality of the Nuremberg Code. So finally, what can be done to stop this? Okay. Um, this comes back to understanding. And this is so important because as you'll see in the next few weeks, Every single case where there's been a major legal transformation and political reformation, it's when they've got the courts back to recognizing the fundamental, natural, God-given right to human liberty and to be a free man or free woman. The Magna Carta was passed because King John was forced to recognize that he couldn't just turn up and tax people 
um, whatever he wants, basically. So King John was forced to basically go back to that. The William Penn case is the most extraordinary case, and I'll be covering that as I mentioned a lot, but in simple terms, in the 1600s, we had a similar situation to today. The English governments had gone completely and utterly stark raving mad, and they were passing outrageous laws after outrageous laws. And then they passed a law which prohibited anyone doing anything to do with the Bible, preaching spirituality or religion. So what I'd be doing, like anything on Sundays, religion would be illegal without a government license and government approval like they do in China. So Penn ignored them completely and he got up and he preached uh, next day on the street. He was arrested and he was put in prison and taken to court and charged with preaching without a license. And Penn, when he was on, you know, giving evidence, he just said, look, he goes, obviously I've broken this law. But he said, we can't deny the fact that I've broken this law. But he turned to the jury and said, I plead with you to listen to me. And he gave a, an inspiring speech where he pretty much said, there was a higher law than this judge's court, which says that any law which goes against the higher law and the rights of freedom of speech, and for me to preach the good name of God, clearly isn't, you know, you know, the law has to be lawful, not just legal. He said, for example, you know, if a law was passed that said everyone had to have all their children killed but for their first one, obviously that law goes against, you know, higher law. So he said, this law is outrageous. And he said, I ask you to hold me not guilty because this law is invalid. And the judge was not particularly happy in him. And he even said to the, um, you know, he just basically turned around and said to the, to the jury, ignore this um, one, you know, ignore them. He said, um, uh, you must put him in, and you must imprison uh, and hold him guilty. And the jury held him not guilty. So I'll go through this more in the coming weeks, but it's an inspiring story how the judge get, was put the jury in jail for three more days to reconsider their verdict. The jury held their ground, then eventually the people started to get furious and march the streets and rise up, demanding that the verdict be recognised and the judge hastily accepted the verdict and the Bill of Rights came in and they brought in protection to acknowledge the higher law, but certain laws just couldn't be changed. That's going to be the best thing we could ever do to see this fixed up in Australia. That's my conclusion. I mean, you've obviously got the small possibility of winning um, by the Constitution, but there's a few things you're going to have to pull off here um, to do that. I think there's certainly an overarching um, argument on this whole thing. I've almost finished, by the way. Someone's um, asking me, but it's almost done before we take questions. Um, but, yeah, so there's a few um, ways to go here. So ways to overturn this law, so to speak. So there's a higher law, um, higher common law is one, as I mentioned. There's a possible constitutional law argument to overcome it. Um, but you've also got to overcome the state of emergency. So I'll show you in a minute a summary kind of thing. But um, yeah, so an invite, so underlying, you know, rights under, you know, higher common law, natural law, so to speak. And that's the best argument you're going to get. So all the major political reformations I mentioned came out of this one here. Um, it's time for this to be recognised in our law. <clears throat> so the higher law, the constitution gives this overriding thing. So, for example, it acknowledges the blessings of Almighty God. There was an argument by William Bastiat or by Frederick Bastiat in the law and others that the blessings of Almighty God in itself in the ambit and the preamble of the constitution says that any laws that come in have to align with the higher law. You know, you can't just pass laws that go against fundamental human liberty, assault, freedom, things like that. There's definitely an you know, experimental medical treatment of that kind. So these are the things. There's a constitutional law argument. It's one way you can overturn it. Um, like I said, that one has got its challenges, in my opinion. And that's because um, very simply um, depends on section 109, um, having a broad view and section 5123A, um, you know, you know, giving Commonwealth basically powers, so to speak, um, in relation to vaccinations, which um, 
I have my doubts. So this is a summary. So this summarizes everything about this here um, on this one here. So that's the first one. The second one is you've got to get your state of emergency overturned. Um, state of emergency being overturned, that's going to be, um, this, this is a big one because um, while, while it is in place, arguably martial law applies. So I'll be covering state of emergency next week as to how we could over, or how it could be possibly overturned. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that's going to have to be taken out. While that is in place, martial law is in place. And that means that the constitutional arguably is suspended anyway. So, um, so yeah, well, there's no state of emergency. That's what you're going to have to argue. So it's a mess. And then ultimately, and I think this is the big one, at the end of the day, you've got to get back to the underlying right on the higher common law. And that's where I always have my greatest success in my own situations. So to finish off before we take the questions, it's, it's, it's a long haul, everyone. That's the main thing. Um, that's why I said I'll be doing four, four um, classes to go through this, possibly have to do five because it's taking longer than I thought. Um, but it's really important to realise that this is going to take some time because, number one, people are going to get educated. Number two, we've got to wake up every single other, you know, you sort of start waking up more people. I think this next federal election is critical. If you can all understand this and everyone here could get politically active, for example, and take all up your part, and, and, and we really find parties that are aligned like Rod Cullerton's or One Nation or whoever, I don't know, you have to, to find parties and get enough of the other parties to stand up um, and so Labour and Liberal do not control the election, uh, that would be a huge thing. It would That would be in itself would make a huge difference because you would be able to at least stop the rot, so to speak. So that would be a good starting point. So sometimes you've got to lose small battles and not be running around trying to win every battle right now and try and hit the big thing, you know, hit the really big thing. Um, and remembering this, this is the thing to get. Life, liberty and property, your right to not be subjected to experimental medical treatment exists because that's just your right. It's your right to do your body, which by and large, three years ago, my body, my choice, you, if I want an abortion, I can have it. Incredible now that the same people are getting up and saying that's different with vaccines. You know, you should be able to force it into people. I've heard celebrities actually saying this. So it was a fact that life, liberty, and property existed that caused men to make laws. So it's getting the people empowered again in a big way and getting the churches really empowered as well, or getting decent churches again. So there's got to be a spiritual reformation uh, first and foremost. There's got to be an educational understanding. And then there's got to be rising up and taking control and getting a large number of people to do that. I noticed someone said about election rigging, there's no doubt that's a potential problem, but at least if you've got, you know, an obvious case, like most people know, or, you know, most awakened people know the US election was rigged and that in itself, um, you know, at least if you're making some kind of a difference, and forcing the thing to come out in the open. That's how I see it anyway. You've got to start with what you've got. So this is the main thing, so questions. Anyway, so I'll, I'll let Steve take the questions because obviously we're going to get lots of questions. Um, Aaron says, uh, and then he'll summarise the important ones. Aaron, our church is not willing to talk about this. Look, Aaron, that's actually a gigantic problem because as you'll see, one of the reasons that many laws throughout history have been stopped has been the power of the churches. What people don't know is in Florida um, last year, it was the churches that really stopped a lot of the shit because Florida was locking down and doing every all the bad crap everyone else was doing last year at first. But the church leaders, especially the biggest church leaders, got up and said no. And one particular guy got arrested and put in jail for running his church in the middle of a lockdown. And he actually told the sheriff, this is outrageous, he said, you guys have got no right to shut us down. He said, God's law is higher than yours, and you know that, basically. And <clears throat> the church has gotten the prayer, and they've gotten the fasting. And as you'll hear in, 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 in webinars in the following weeks, that in history, prayer, fasting, um, church leaders standing their ground was quite common. 
<coughs> and within about a week or two, the sheriff came and profusely apologized, let him out and promised him they wouldn't lock down the churches anymore. And they changed all the laws eh, and everything in Florida. So the churches, yeah, I mean, look, I think, it, I mean, the churches are an absolutely, uh, are shocking right now. I don't take any of them seriously right now. So, Steve, you want to, if you feel free to come on. Yep. Okay. So, um, probably a couple of pressing ones from earlier, Warren, about the were about the upcoming census and um, how to get out of it. I think it's probably to be as blunt as I can with that. There's we had several questions at the start there. You know, should I should I take the census? How do I get out of it if I don't want to be in it? Yeah. Well, look. <clears throat> I'm going to be covering all that in the next few weeks and going into these things in more depth. And that was why we've got to do things systematically. So the census, the short answer is, look, I haven't done one for like years. Um, it's to do with the way, it's like anything, you read the requirements. That's with anything you read the requirements. So um, I read, I just read the census. I read who has to do it, who's exempt. And nearly always you'll find a reason that you're exempt. And I found a reason I was exempt. I found an exemption from, um, you know, I found an exemption from the when I'm in voting fines years ago when I decided for a time I wasn't going to vote. And I found exemption from the census, which worked. So, yes, there's always exemptions. There's always remedies. But, yes, we'll be covering that in the next few weeks. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we're getting a lot of... Um a lot of individual type questions too, Warren, about, um, you know, if you refuse to give your name, like, I guess, um, individual instances, which, and again, my, my response to that is, well, all of those things have to be tested in a court of law. Like it's, it's hard to give a blanket answer for individual things about the, um, legitimacy of the state of emergency. Um, you know, those sorts of things. Well, the problem is the state of emergency is quite simple. Um, people who say they refuse to do the direction, well, all I can say is that is that expect to go through hell to do it. Now, if that's your, what I call karmic path that you want to go down, by all means. But right now, as the law stands, we're in a state of emergency. That means that rights are suspended. The chief health officer can issue mandates and directions. If you breach the mandate or directions or you refuse to answer a question under martial law, you're put in the brick, so to speak. That's... Now, whether or not that's legally valid is a whole different question. Um, when you read the state of emergency provisions and what it's for, I mean, it clearly is a, an abuse of the process, um, but like Steve said, it has to be determined in a court of law and you have to be willing to go down that path. Because right now, Australia is, on, if you're on the state of emergency, Esther asks, is Australia under martial law? Well, if you're under state of emergency, Esther, my understanding is every state and territory are, therefore they're under martial law. So yes, they're not saying it like that, but they are. An interesting question here too from Elaine. Is there a conflict of interest if politicians and government officials have shares in the manufacture of vaccines? Oh, oh. No. <laughs> uh, uh, politicians that's, that's in conflict, an conflict of interest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how long we got? <laughs> oh, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, are the courts closed because we're under martial law? I don't believe so. No. Um, the protest and rally work, someone says. Um, my view on that is generally they only work if you've got a large enough group of people in proportion. Like, let's say that you've got 10% of the population marching the street or 20%. Yeah, you've got a voice. And even in as London have found out, they've got about 10% or more now walking the streets in their protests and still no one's listening. So right now, I think they're a complete and utter waste of time because people are going to become educated. And um, there's, there's, and, and I think the pro if you're going to go the protest route, you've got to brand them correctly. Like the reason that Trump took off an impossible win was he branded his um, rally and his movement very, very well with wisdom. Most protests today just aren't branded with wisdom. They're not given in a way. I think right now a lot of WA and Australia are very upset with what's going on. And I think that if a protest was well branded and focused on the coercive vaccines and focused on the effect on your employment, on your business, I reckon the numbers would be significantly greater. But I think most protests organise on a complete ego trip and they just want someone to vent at and, you know, soothe their little egos. That's my personal opinion on it. And I think that if 
all the protest organizers humbled themselves and got some decent branding getting in, they might have some chance in the longer term, not immediately, but in the longer term. Yeah, Warren, there's a couple of questions here specifically about that um, beautiful um, law that the WA government passed in 2016 or 15. My goodness, that's horrendous. Exactly. About getting getting it getting that repealed, um, and if and why hasn't anyone had it overturned and things like oh. that? Well, the problem is you may remember from the lesson tonight about the Parliament. Um, so this means that in West Australia, that Colin Barnett passed it in the lower house and the upper house. So you're going to have to get a bill presented to the West Australian lower house and then approved by the by. So in other words, you have to convince Mark McGowan's government to overturn it. Now, that's not as impossible as it sounds because the Attorney General in West Australia is John Quigley. Now, he's a markedly higher character, better individual than the people who were before him with the Liberals who passed his laws. Like, <clears throat> I mean... With all the criticism of Mr. McGowan, and I don't obviously he's done they've done some not so great things over here. I mean, there's like our wetlands where we live here that were being ruined by the previous government who passed that law have been fixed up. Um, there's been he kept his word. There was a promise by John Quigley when they were going to get in as electron to clean up the industry of insurance and everything he promised he did. Um, yeah, so John Quigley, by and large, and, you know, I've got friends in the Awaken movement who all know him and like him. He actually was a very passionate guy for rights before he got in. So I actually think that were the right, you know, delegation seeing someone like him presenting this wisely. Yeah, look, I think it's possible. I, I don't, I wouldn't write it off. I think in Victoria, I would say you're in real trouble. I would say um, in WA, you do have a chance because the McGowan government have shown signs of being very conscious in other ways, even though not in others. Like we've seen extraordinary initiatives to fix up environmental issues where I live near the Coburn Sound or around, sorry, Woodman's Point and that, which for years the locals have been trying to get fixed and they've actually fixed them all. And I've met our local representative over here, David Scaife, and I, I clicked with him. I liked him. He there's been a pollution problem near where I lived and he went and personally campaigned until the company stopped doing it. So there are some good things being done by the West Australian Labor government here. So, um, if, you know, apart from the obvious, you know, insane um, vaccine kind of, you know, f um, fervor, they've done some reasonably good things. So I do think with WA it's possible. And I actually was talking to someone about this today with Quigley. I think it's possible. But yeah, it's going to have to be addressed. We don't want that on the books. Yeah. Um... Oh, of all that, sorry, Steve, but on that one, what is interesting is I know someone actually told one of the politicians here about it and they said, don't be absurd, that, there's no such law here. And when he said he was in shock, he goes, how did that get in? Because most politicians, when laws get passed, keep in mind what happens, they get swamped with legislation, thousands of pages, they're bored shitless, they just have a quick squeeze and then just, just approve it. So most don't even read it. Yeah, I, I'm just, there's more about the QR codes, Warren, about the legality of giving a false name and address. Can you be fined for that? Um, oh, look, I, I, I'll, I'll just give my blunt opinion if it offends people. I think if you're giving a false name and address and all that, I think you're really being stupid because um, one thing I learned in law is that doing nothing, it's hard. Like, for example, if you went to, if you didn't lodge a tax return for years, I'm not saying you do that, and went to court, you may have a chance of not getting in trouble for tax evasion by just arguing that you just didn't do it because you never got round to it and forgot and get a penalty, that's it. If you deliberately filed a false tax return, you go straight to jail. And um, yeah, you're better off just to not do it um, or whatever else. My personal approach is I just go in there and I think it's just not my job. If I use my credit card, they can track me down if they want to. And I do use my credit card anyway. And if the company insists on doing it, I just insist on signing a paper register and I just do that. And it rarely happens in practice. If you, I think I've only been asked twice in the last, you know, six months to do it. So yeah, that's my, um, you know, that's my take on that. I, 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 I think it's outrageous, but the problem is state of emergency. Arr, state of emergency means they can do this shit and get away with it. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, <laughs> but there's. There's lots of individual questions, Warren. Some um, fairly pointed ones about um, 
the West Australian government requesting military support. Um, Tassie, their state of emergency finished on the 26th of October and they're under public health emergencies since then um, with the health department rather than the police commissioner in charge. Um, so there's just lots of individual... Um, yeah, look, um, I know I've just lost two hours, so I want to probably just uh, yeah. make a couple more comments from an end. Yeah. Uh, plus my battery's low on my computer. But um, yeah, look, I'm just... The, the thing is... Um, state of yeah look it's i'm trying to remember what something i was going to say but the i'm trying to think what i was thinking about um yeah look, the state of emergencies and everything like that they're, they're in place yeah my battery's low the the martial law um i might just go in the other room so it doesn't just collapse as we're talking but martial law or whatever else being in place means they can pass this stuff. And the main thing is we've got to get to the bottom and get undone and realise that a society doesn't get to the state we've got to without neglecting its rights and power for a long time. So I, I, I tell people who are, who are in my own movement and work, I say, first and foremost, don't blame the government. Blame yourself for letting it get to this. There were, there were people for years, myself included, who were doing seminars trying to wake people up for 20 years and people weren't listening. People are more concerned in getting their properties, going to the pub and getting drunk or whatever else. We're at this place because we chose to be completely and utterly complacent to this stuff. And we prefer to live an easy life and we prefer to just kind of, you know, get on with life and do everything else. That's the reality. We are, where we're at today, we're at, we're at the day. It's a grim position, but it's not hopeless. We've still got a period of time where we can stop this before we turn into a full China. The reality is, as you saw today, there's still some constitutional protection left. We can get this state of emergency knocked out and, and, um, and have a spiritual awakening. This whole thing can be stopped and even reversed. So it's hope, you know. But we've just, so this, there is actually hope right now. I think two years from now, I think it would be, yeah, I, 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 I would probably not be saying that. You know, I'd be saying run for the hills if two years from now we still haven't woken up. So right now there's hope because we still we haven't been able to pull off what they would like to have pulled off. You know, the constitutions by and large, they wanted a republic, they didn't get it. The reason they've got this ridiculous state of emergency is there's no other way for them to bypass the constitutional protections that are there. So that does give hope. It does make it possible, you know, but... Um, yeah, the main, just getting really, really educated as a people. So this is why I emphasise fast, frantic, fearful action will get you exhausted and will go nowhere. So, you know, it took a long time to get into this mess. It's not going to happen overnight. That's my answer on that one. So this is why I'm doing this education to really help people out because I appreciate that for people to find this out is really difficult. That's why I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm not doing this for any recognition. I'm just doing it because I bloody want my state and my country back to a good state and I want to do my part. And there's others who'll be doing the same and hopefully there's others, I'm sure there's plenty of others a lot smarter than me who'll be teaching as well. So between all of us in the army of God, the, the wisdom can get out there. So that's probably my response to most of those questions. Yeah. Um, so and, and, and Lorraine asked, why do they... Um, um, do lockdowns just before the state of emergency ends so they can extend oh. the state of emergency, right? Well, <laughs> Queensland, yeah, Queensland, yeah, yeah, the exactly. 30th, it ended on the 31st of March and they found new cases on the 30th. So oh, look, it's, 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 it's the game, yeah. right? Yeah, same same in June. It's, it's just the game they're playing. Weirdly enough, the only case state that hasn't done that, WA have probably stayed the closest to the true spirit of emergency in that they've just had 14-day rollings, which is kind of what they originally said they would do, just 14-day rollings. So... WA is probably the only state I found that don't think their case is to state of emergency. They just do it. But that kind of summarizes our state. Yeah. And, and those who live here would know what I mean. It's extraordinarily compliant. Like people just kind of do what the government tells them. And even the last lockdown they had, I mean, people were wearing masks after they lifted the mandate almost everywhere. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm good little sheep. Yeah, Pat, well done, oh. everyone. Congratulations. WA, <laughs> it, it's just extraordinary. Yeah, we've got some very awakened people over here. Yeah. So um yeah look next week we'll be continuing on this one so wednesday meeting for those of you who um sunday um this is a spiritual side so we had the spiritual and the political side so the first hour grace does quantum collapse in other words 
We've even been looking at the quantum energy around vaccines, jabs to help people collapse it and let go of the charges and the energy. That's been proven to have extraordinary impact. And then I teach on higher spiritual laws. So sometimes on laws of prosperity, I've taught on the dark night of the soul we did, um, look at ancient spiritual laws and teachings and prophecies about these times we've looked at. We looked at the microchip and where it's in, in, in sacred scrolls. We've done teachings on all kinds of stuff. So that's to give, you know, spiritual stuff. And anyone is, is there anyone interested in that one? Um, you go to our City Awakening. Um, and yeah, look, our, when you say what church, we just have our own spiritual movement. That's the short answer. Um, like our own, the world needs a new religion or spirituality. And religion has got a bad name because the churches have been so horrific. But the truth is the world does need it. Every society where you've seen human rights maintained and free society, you've had a healthy political um, rights and freedoms that are being kept accountable by healthy by the churches and by healthy religion that teaches the people the good balance between good morals, good spiritual teachings, guiding them to grow in their consciousness and ethics and good behavior of each other while at the same time giving people by and large freedom and not imposing religious dogma. So Ken Wilber in his book, Religion of Tomorrow, it's a very hard book to read, but um, he actually talks about, for example, um, the future of the world and saying how it's critical. Um, he, he writes a whole book on consciousness exploration. This is the book that um, he says it needs to be a new religion. He says Christianity, Hindus, all the others are by and large they got they're outdated. In other words, it needs to be a new breed that meets the exigencies or the um, you know the the needs of humanity at this time. And I agree. So that's more what we're about. We're building a whole new breed of religion that brings the fundamentals of the you know the strengths of the Christian upbringing that we had, combined also with the, with the various others, the high laws of consciousness, the laws of the sacred scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many of them prophesied these times that we're in now. Um, but also showed you that the way out would be to enter a golden age. That's why I'm very confident that we're going to come into a golden age out of this. I don't know how much time, but they're very confident. So we do that side of things. Some would be interested, some aren't. If you've already got your own spiritual stuff, that's fine. Um, you know, go along and support that. If you don't, um, yeah, that's like I said, that's just to awaken um, because we know that that's the, that's the critical part, you know, of doing it. Yeah, and Warren, right. yes, there's a couple of questions there. Yes, it is recorded. All Sunday Sunday sessions are recorded. And yep. Grace has just put in the chat there. You go to City Awakening, which has got the Facebook link there, the groups, and then slash 389, da, da, da. But it's City Awakening. Um, and um, you can see in the chat there um, the actual link for, for anyone who wants to join. And um, I look forward to seeing you all on Sunday. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. And appreciate your support. And like I said, let's just do the job, get on with it and do our part. And, you know, those who resonate, I look forward to seeing you next week on Wednesday night. And, um, yeah, and I look forward to seeing those of you who want to come on Sunday as well. So thanks, everyone. Have a great week, everyone. See you Sunday or next week.